Jack is a brilliant person. He not only speaks Chinese, but he was in naval intelligence and is now a really rock solid journalist and reporter and general social change agent on this planet. Um, so Jack, welcome and thank you so much for taking part. And I know it's rather late. I hope you're not too tired. Where are you? No, are it's you okay. In, I'm actually the... in uh, Washington, D.C. So we finished oh. up our, uh, you know, some work on One American News earlier today and had a good, you know, good night with my wife. And I said, I said, sweetheart, I'm, I'm going to stay up a little late tonight. I've been asked to do a show and, you know, there's sort of an emergency crisis going on. And she said, she said, Jack, I've been married to you for a while. Do what you got to do. It's, it's, it's like, whatever. Well, she's, good. She's, I'm... She knew what she was getting. She knew what she signed up for. Put it that way. Well, then she is not only a good woman, but obviously a sane one. Um, anyway, Jack, I would love you to talk about what you tweeted to me earlier. I think I'd like you to just launch into what you wanted to talk about, which like I to. thought was very so, exciting. One big backstory, and we're talking, of course, about Julian Assange. We're talking about this potential extradition, which it does seem to be uh, in the works at this point. We're not re really too sure on the timing, but it does seem to be on the works that there's going to be a, a, ch a chain of events here where Assange is, uh, loses his asylum rights from Ecuador, is then handed over to the custody of the British government, who will then extradite him to the U.S. to face charges for some such thing that we're not really told of yet, um, most likely related to the Espionage Act. But what a lot of people don't realize is that a lot of the backstory to the U.S. Uh, government putting out these, these charges on Assange actually has come out already and it's much deeper than people realize and the big headline that i threw up on one american news was that james comey the former fbi director played a pivotal role in killing really killing what would have been an immunity deal for julian with the u.s government now we're not sure if it was going to be a temporary one or a potential permanent one but they were at one point in discussions between the WikiLeaks legal team, and this has all come out, the emails have come out, the text messages have come out. Uh, we can, you know, we can cite those if you guys want to go look at it. The Hill's got them all posted up, John Solomon, that at one point the WikiLeaks legal team was talking to members of the Trump administration. In, they were talking early 2017, so not long after uh, President Trump first took office, and looking at some sort of immunity deal because it was related to not necessarily the 2016 stuff, which everyone you know likes to talk about in the media very much, but it, this was actually related to a release that WikiLeaks put out in March and April of 2017, which was called Vault 7, and really had to do with a comprehensive look at the CIA's uh, cyber warfare programs and their abilities to what we now know, their abilities to uh, tap into uh, cars to take remote control of, of you know automobiles and vehicles smart tvs operating systems whether it be on your smartphone whether it be on your laptop whether it be on a, you know, on a tablet right now you know their ability to do that their ability to mimic other intelligence services and make it look like another intelligence service had done something on the internet and leave traces leave digital footprints in that place so all of this had come out in vault seven but we back up a little bit to the backstory, the part that hadn't come out before, and what was going on. So the CIA knew that they had been compromised. They knew that their uh, their tools, their cyber warfare tools, had been compromised, and they were fairly certain that Assange had gotten a hold of them. Well, instead of just releasing them, Assange reaches out to the Trump administration. They've, they've newly come to power and says, look, guys, I'm willing to make a deal with you. I'm willing to go through here, talk about what I have, talk with you guys about uh, potentially rolling back some of the stuff that would be released, but I'd like to work on some sort of immunity grant uh, for myself with the United States because facing this ridiculous warrant in Britain, even though the, the Swedes have dropped their need for a warrant in the first place, um, and looking for some assistance there. And so at one point, and this, this is key is, and this, this is all being done between intermediaries. And there's lots of different bit, you know, players and people flying between Washington and London and having these meetings back and forth. They used to call it shuttle diplomacy. And that's essentially what was going on here. Um, 
Well, at one point, one of the lawyers on the WikiLeaks legal team says, and it, this, this, the ball starts to get rolling. It looks like it's starting to move forward. At one point, one of the lawyers that's, you know, really an intermediary, um, it says, we should, we should get the Senate involved. So they reach out to the Senate Intel Committee. Then the, the vice chairman of the Senate Intel Committee, Mark Werner, he's a Democrat, reaches out to James Comey about all of this. And this, it seems to be, is Comey's first real understanding that a deal is in the works. This is Comey's first inkling that something like this is going to happen. Now, some, now, what's interesting is that someone at the DOJ knew before James Comey, at least as far as we know, according to these emails and text messages. The person at the DOJ that found out early on was a guy who goes by the name of Bruce Orr. And if anyone's been following the uh, Fusion GPS uh, storyline or anything to do with that, people realize that Bruce Orr is the white, or excuse me, the husband of Nellie Orr, who was working at Fusion GPS, and that became sort of the conduit for the uh, the Russian disinformation steel dossier um, between Bruce Orr. So this guy's involved in this deal as well. So Comey gets wind of the whole thing, and Comey issues a shutdown order. Comey goes to uh, goes back to the lawyers, goes back to people on that side, and immediately tells everyone, stand down, stand down, stand down, shut this whole thing down. He puts the kibosh on it big time. So Julian gets that message and says, well, the whole thing is shut down. But here's the issue, is Comey didn't go and sanitize this with the rest of the Trump administration. He was freelancing. He was doing it on, its own, on his own. This is March of 2017 going into April of 2017. We now know, of course, Comey's fired May of 2017. So one month after he kills this immunity deal. Um, after Assange heard about the stand down order, he went through, he obviously, as we know with the history here, he went through with the release of Vault 7. That leads to Mike Pompeo then coming out saying, because remember Mike Pompeo, he's the current US Secretary of State, but at the time he was the CIA director. He came out and said, uh, uh, slammed WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks is a foreign hostile intelligence service. Uh, he was, and he was made that statement specifically in response to the Vault 7 release. Uh, and we can see that that immunity deal was, was being talked about right up until the point where Comey killed it. Then Assange does the release. Then Pompeo makes his statement. And about a month afterwards, Comey is fired by Trump. And we don't know if, if how much of that, uh, you know, Assange drama goes into the firing of Comey. But what's, it's interesting to see that much play out in such a short time frame. Uh, it may have just been one of the many reasons that, that were in place from both the left and the right that people wanted to get rid of James Comey. And what people need to understand is, is that at one point there was an appetite from the Trump administration for an immunity deal for Assange. And, and certainly uh, from, from the president, I've heard, I'm sure many people have heard that President Trump has been interested in some sort of, coming to some sort of agreement with Assange rather than going forward with the full prosecution. Uh, he's been kind of hands off right now because they're applying so much pressure to him from the intelligence community to go after Assange. But really, it, he understands, number one, the politics of the situation, of course, where uh, you know Assange was seen as someone who was helpful to, to President Trump during 2016, but also the very real threat of you know essentially going against the First Amendment and going against Supreme Court law, Supreme Court decision, the New York Times case, where, and as, as I'm sure many people have brought up, and my, my good friend Sandra Fairbanks will bring up uh, at length, the idea that uh, under US law, it is not illegal to publish government information if you did not, you, you yourself steal that information, right? That's always, I mean, this is something the New York Times does on a daily basis, this is something the Washington Post does on a daily basis. Uh, at One American News, you know, I, get government information all the time, right? I was getting information on the Mueller report. I was getting information on uh, deals that were being struck with, with you know, people that were part of the uh, uh, prosecution. And, you know, I would report that out publicly, but that was not, you know, <laughs> that was not specifically given to me or specifically disclosed to me from any official channel. But that being said, I was able to get the information, so I reported it. And a lot of that has come out and been public and been accurate. And so, 
what it sets a very strong precedent. And I think that Trump is cognizant of that, that to go after Assange essentially means that the same standard would apply to the New York Times, Washington Post, all the others. And there's actually sort of a kind of backwards reasoning for, uh, for Trump. I mean, I think a lot of people know, regardless of what you think of him, um, that uh, he certainly has quite a testy relationship with the media. Um, but of course, he knows that you know, there isn't really much that he can do about it. And so uh, I've, I've heard it, he said at one point or another is, you know, if I don't get to go after these guys at CNN or those guys at the New York Times, then how come you get to go after Assange? Not fair. Mm. Kind of the way yeah, he looked well, at it. Well, first of all, I want to just say that I personally found what you just said absolutely thrilling. Um, it makes me very, very hopeful. Uh, I, you know, back in December when uh, Rudy Giuliani came on, on to, I think it was Fox News, and said, hey, Julian Assange has not committed a crime. Otherwise, you know, the whole Pentagon Papers thing would have, you know, the New York Times would have gone to, you know, he, he is. And that's right. Trump's, I should, we should explain that for people, yeah. too, that the Pentagon Papers case is, was the New York Times and Washington Post Supreme Court decision. I mean, there, there's a Steven Spielberg movie about this. Well, I don't know that that necessarily is going to portray tremendous accuracy. But the thing that's so thrilling about what you're saying is that what this is really is a battle between the, uh, the um, intel agencies, the secret services with, you know, I mean, look, this is so deep, it's almost hard for me to think of the right question, but essentially what you're, what you're saying is that there is pressure from the secret service to Trump saying, we want our man because he exposed, uh, and we don't want him to in the future expose anything more, presumably. That's, I mean, it's not yeah. just revenge. He, it's not just he, revenge. He caught us with our pants down and, and right. we want to do something about it. Okay. You were in Intel. You were uh, presumably an analyst. Were you a, a naval? Uh, yeah. Sig yeah, you were an analyst. So looking at this situation, what would you feel Julian's lawyers would need to do um, to encourage Trump to keep going with his fake news because he's going halfway if he allows them to grab assange then as i've i've been like stalking president trump saying you can't go halfway on fake news you have to you know free julian assange and bring him back into where he should be doing his job because he's talking about fake news let the man who has a hundred percent accuracy right WikiLeaks has 100% accuracy on all of their documentation and reporting. So to me, I, I would be frightened if Trump doesn't save Julian Assange. One, uh, and this is something that I've, I've also discussed with people uh, that have connections to the intelligence community other, outside of myself. And one potential immunity deal that I could see being on the table is um, and, you know, this wouldn't have to be public, but, you know, a type of scenario where Assange is essentially brought in by the U.S. government and given immunity as a sort of a sort of expert witness, in a sense, where there may be information that he knows about U.S. government systems that could, you know, from a per potential of, hey, this is where ho actual hostile intelligence services are attempting to penetrate your networks or potentially in some cases have penetrated your networks. Here are people that uh, have found ways into your systems. This, these are your cybersecurity blind spots. So you, you change and I, look, I come from a background of, of I was an intelligence analyst and collector. And so I always, I always look at a situation of, of what benefit could this be to knowledge to you know and essentially to to granting more knowledge and and you know hopefully you know providing for more security uh you know for the american people and you know essentially you're lo you're talking about someone who's probably the world's leading expert in cybersecurity, probably the world's leading expert in understanding how these systems work uh, wouldn't it make more sense to bring him in as a subject matter expert in this situation give him immunity and ask him what he knows debrief him uh, have have these discussions with him, and instead of treating him as as a as a criminal, 
treat him as a source of information. And it could potentially, I don't know exactly what the parameters of it would, you know, would entail. Obviously there'd be lots of, you know, lots of stipulations on that, you know, not revealing sources and methods and all those things, but it could potentially be something that I could see both some reasonable people on both sides agreeing to. So really the galling part of this is that, you know, I feel like saying, why the hell should he? You know, I mean, he hasn't, why should he do anything? He, he, he's a journalist and a publisher. He hasn't done anything wrong. Just let him go, but make him free. You know, why should he have to engage in some exchange? But this is planet Earth and right. things work. <laughs> <laughs> right. And this is how things work is that you basically, you make a deal. And God knows Trump likes his deals. And I, God bless me. I know everybody is really against Trump, but I honestly believe that he wants America to go back to a constitutional, you know, perfection instead of the terrible mess that we're in, in terms of the level of corruption. Um, just going back, because I really want to have you go into detail about what you've just explained, because it's the first time I've heard this. I mean, okay. this is, must be right. I mean, I can't be the only person that hasn't heard this unless this is like breaking news. Is this? Like a completely no. New... This this was in a report at the Hill um, about about six or seven months ago, but it was it was really overlooked because at the time it's actually something that came out while people were researching uh, sort of the Russia Gate scenario, while people were digging into that stuff, and mm -hmm. this was something that came out as an aside of that reporting, uh, mm -hmm. but I picked up on it very quickly because I've always have been very focused on WikiLeaks as an issue and but it, it it didn't get a lot more play because at the time it was so inundated by these these uh, you know, you know, Russia claims and allegations yeah I, I, I well so there, there's too many things going on in my mind about what to ask you about but certainly this Russia gate thing as an analyst as somebody that was in the Intel services in the Navy what on earth would have been the motivation to play so dangerously with lies, right? And hope to topple, because that's presumably why they did it. They don't want Trump to be president. So why does the Secret Service not want Trump to be president? So a big part of this, I think, and this, this is kind of the way I look at it, is I actually think that the, the original intention for Russia Gate was and, and I'm referring to specifically the the phony steel dossier, the disinformation campaign. I think the original intention was that it was going to blow up uh, big. It was supposed to be the October surprise, which is something in U.S. politics uh, because our elections are always in November. The October surprise refers to a sort of scandal or revealed truth about mm -hmm. a candidate that comes out at the last minute that changes. The race and essentially we did have several of those uh one was more with anthony weiner and his laptop than anything else mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um i think the russia gate this this dossier was supposed to be the sort of october surprise uh to be used against trump the problem was but was why so why why use who who used it that means that the secret service is supporting the democrats or some i mean why would they want to put an October surprise and get rid of Trump or have him lose, gotcha. you know, why? Um, I think it's an interesting situation where the careerist and sort of institutionalists in the intelligence community were aligned with Hillary, but not necessarily just because she was, you know, it's, it's not a partisan thing. They would have been aligned with Hillary or Jeb, right? Um, mm -hmm. Trump, Came okay, wait, out. sorry, I'm going to I'm going to pick at this for a second. So you're saying that they aligned themselves with Hillary and oh, sorry, say the next person again. Uh, Jeb Bush. Right. Um, what is their allegiance to them? Is it just that they help them in their secret service work in the sense that they're not going to get in their way? Why would they prefer them? Because that certainly for me, I've kept wondering why are they protecting it's sort Hillary? Of, um, they those candidates are what we would consider part of the establishment in in America. Uh, uh, both of them have sort of the uh, quote unquote um, 
you know, dignified names, right? The, you know, going back, I'm a Game of Thrones guy, so I, you know, we would call them mm. the, the the lordly houses of mm -hmm. of of the realm. Uh, whereas, you know, House Trump, you know, is some sort of mercantilist, merchant class. You know, doesn't have mm -hmm. has more money, but doesn't have the title, right? Whereas Clinton's, it's actually the opposite. They have the title, but they don't have any money. Um, and that's why they, you know, that's why they're mm -hmm. sort of second class gentry. But okay, not to go too much into Game of Thrones, but um, mm -hmm. it's a uh, it's a situation where they didn't, they really didn't know what he would do and they have so many well laid plans right for um moving forward in terms of global stability moving forward in terms of their plan for what for what they consider to be global stability global, more, global uh harmony global hegemony that mm -hmm. trump coming in was and as stated purpose was as a as a sort of wrench as a sort of uh stopping block to many of those agendas that they didn't want that and so this this conspiracy which really was a conspiracy theory uh was was generated with the intention it was it was never intended to stand up to scrutiny and that's why you know that's why this, this big investigation for two years promote no collusion because it was never intended to withstand that level of scrutiny it was only intended to you know pull together some very loose strands and just like I say, this is someone who understands politics as well. It's just supposed to be a political thing, right? You know, you, mm -hmm. you drop it out at the end of the race, you make it look like this guy's tied to Asia or excuse me, Russia, and, um, you know, and then Hillary wins and nobody ever talks about it again. That's all this was ever supposed to be. But then they caught themselves in trouble. They caught themselves in a lie, essentially. And instead of just sort of letting it go away, they, they, uh, for whatever reason, they decided to use that as a, um, you know, the Latin phrase for when you start a war as a causus belli, so the, the, the cause of belligerence, the cause of, of warfare uh, against, in this case, a sitting president in order to bend him back to that, that initial agenda and, and reassert their power with an administration over which they felt they had no power. Well, I certainly know now why it's called the deep state, because clearly it's meant to be that an elected official, uh, i.e. a president, is ruling the country. But by what your description is, that the secret services act like a permanent government and they make their own plans for America, irrespective of whether the American people even want that. And uh, I think that what frightens me about what essentially are people who are driven by secret and hidden motivations where none of us get to know what their intentions are, um, align themselves with, for instance, Hillary, that certainly I think she is unfit to lead this country, but maybe that's the whole thing, is that all that it is is that she just does what the secret services want her to do. So, do you think I'm being? Well, but remember every, uh, yeah. you know, every every coup um, participant in in history has always said, "I'm doing this for the good of the country. Mm -hmm. I'm doing this for the good of, you know, only only we know what's best for the country. So only we have the ability to right the wrong of this. You know, the people made a terrible mistake, and we have to protect the people from this." you know, sort of person, but that's, and, and then, so they're then willing to destroy the system in their mind to protect the system. And this is, you know, go throughout mm -hmm. any, the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire, right? This was, mm -hmm. you know, Julius Caesar, this was the whole, uh, it's the same line of thinking that we always hear. In fact, the actually, um, <laughs> from what you're describing is there's an old British sitcom from the seventies called Yes Minister. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> which, if you're, I don't know if you're familiar, but it's, it's actually quite similar. It, it, it uh, mm -hmm. describes this dynamic, portrays this dynamic very well, where you have a, a new, you know, newly elected um, government, uh, one of the MPs is brought in as as minister. I went back and watched a few episodes of it with a friend of mine recently, and it, it really fits in because it shows how the people in the bureaucracy, the people who are that permanent civil service state, mm -hmm. are able to just run rings around these politicians. And further their own agendas, whatever that may be, 
regardless of what the politicians say in many cases, or in other cases, they're able to bend the politicians to their will just using various uh, tricks and loopholes in the system to get what they want. Well, by this time, uh, by at this point rather, the Secret Service has terrifying levels of technical abilities to, as you were describing with Vault 7, um, uh, to manipulate and control the environment. And I remember Kevin Shipp, do you know him? He's a former CIA yes. guy. Uh, he, was, he said that they called it the Paranoia Palace. And so really, I guess, going back to your first, you know, hopeful message that Trump was willing to negotiate a deal. And let's accept that it, we're on planet Earth and it's going to have to be a deal. And Julian's going to have to give something that Trump wants. Do you think if there Trump is, if there's any if there's any person that would be willing to make a deal, it's Donald Trump. Well, exactly. So do you think the Secret Service? would take him out? Do you think that the Secret Service has taken out presidents in the past? Uh, I think now there's too many eyes on something like this for, for that to be effective. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think they would do so. Also, um, WikiLeaks has, has, if you look at their Twitter account, one of the things they pointed out was in the media strategy of all this, uh, Ecuador and the UK are most likely going to um, affirm that the death penalty or anything related to that will be taken off the table, that, that Assange will be alive throughout all of this. So because they're making that such a big deal in the press, that leads me to believe that they're talking imprisonment, they're talking prosecution, due process, rather than anything like that. There's just too many eyes, and because they realize that um, they don't want to make a martyr of Julian Assange. They don't want to make him to be this, uh, you know, a hero. They, they want to demonize him. They want to mm. uh, make him appear to be the scum of the earth. Once the propaganda campaign against him starts, starts, that's, that's what will happen. I mean, it will be, he'll be- a Oh, sorry, you mean, you, mean, you mean continue? Because start, it certainly did a oh, long time ago. Well, I mean, it's, when, it's going to kick into high gear very quickly uh, once mm. this begins. Um, there's so, going to be there's going to be stories, headlines. Um, they will say that uh, you know his leaks led to battlefield deaths. They will say that his leaks led to uh, they'll they'll blame all the failures of the Iraq War on Julian Assange. They'll blame. The rise of ISIS on Julian Assange. I mean, take your pick. They, they'll, they're just going to mm. blame everything on him uh, for for a long time to make him out to be the, you know, this this number one to make him out to be someone who's uh, complicit in this. Uh, number two, um, the left will continue to paint him as a, uh, 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 I guess, some some sort of stooge of Russian intelligence services uh, in order to facilitate the political interference operations. And if you notice, um, something I've been looking for very closely in what, what I know or what we do know so far about this Mueller report is that there hasn't really been anything that's come out yet that has any reference to Assange or WikiLeaks. And I think that's going to be a huge section of the report when it does come out and most likely will be used to fuel a lot of headlines in the lead up to, or in in the, the uh, in the course of any any Assange prosecution or trial. Well, thank you for explaining that. If you were going to analyze this for the CIA and the Secret Services, and you were going to look at this situation so that it resolved, because I think this is definitely something they want, that it resolves in a very clean way. Um, if you were talking to Gina Haspel, who doesn't seem like the most sympathetic character, given her nickname of Bloody Gina, but let's say you were going to talk to Gina Haspel and you were going to discuss with her and analyze how to, to not only honor the Constitution, because I've, I've got to believe that these people care about the Constitution. I mean, I've got to believe that people working in the CIA, with the exception of psychos or something, that they actually really are patriotic. So if you were going to advise the CIA 
how to handle this. I mean, I, I hope I'm not putting you on the spot and that you need to think about it more, but what would you recommend to them to resolve this in a way that maintains freedom of speech, that doesn't make America look like the bad guy? Because everyone is going to look at America as the bad guy, irrespective well, I think, of. You know. I, I would kind of go back to what I was saying: is is cut a deal with cut a deal with a guy like this, because mm-hmm. they're looking at it from. So I, I wrote a book called 4D Warfare, uh, probably the copy of tonight, and okay. and the idea on that is is really talking about uh, fourth generation warfare, which is something I studied in the military, and applying that to social political uh, realm, and essentially. Mm-hmm. It teaches you how to look at things through the David versus Goliath lens. Always put every situation into terms of David versus Goliath. And basically, all right, you're going to have to expand on that. I I I don't quite understand. Okay, it comes from this. It comes from this old uh, William S. Lind quote where he says, "Nobody ever read the story of David versus Goliath and identified with Goliath." (laughs) Right. So. When you're setting up a situation, you always want to be the David in the situation. You don't want to be the Goliath, right? And this is right. true for business. This is true for relationships. This is true for politics. True for anything. And so you always want. So look at the U.S. and the Iraq War, right? Shock and awe, right? Complete failure. Mm-hmm. Why? Because it looked like Goliath, right? The tanks mm-hmm. rolling down the streets and the you know, the, the, the soldiers uh, in body armor rolling down, it's, you're not going to win hearts and minds like that. You can't, you just physically can't. Um, so flip that around to this situation. Do you want it to look like a situation? I, and I would, I would say this to, to Director Haspel or anyone else. Uh, I'm sure they're going to be watching this later. Um, <laughs> they, they always keep very close attention to what I say about her. I got, a, I got an article in the New York Times last time I attacked her. Um, well, good. Then do a good job of telling her well, because what you I think. Pointed out that, well, because I pointed out that Gina Haspel was the station chief in London when all of the spying on the Trump campaign was going on in London. And I said, there's no way this could have gone on without her knowing about it. it there was some mm-hmm. statement. To, oh, I was peripherally aware of it, but not briefly. No, you were the station chief, Gina. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Please. Mm-hmm. If you didn't know what was going on, then you're either... Uh, you're you're either just lying to me or you're completely incompetent. As right. To, well, know, I, I, that, like, so so what I would explain is, you don't want the, it to look like the full force and power of the U.S. government is targeting one individual because if you do that, you're giving that individual power. Number one, which is something if if you don't like Julian, that's something you probably don't want to do, right? Um, you you want to not make an example of him and throw the book at him and do some do some gigantic huge show trial because excuse me if you do that well you're just going to create hundreds and thousands of more julian assange's right you're just going to there will be a percentage of people that say i want to do what he did and there is already to some extent um but you're going to make so many more of it and probably you're going to get people who are even in the intelligence community now to look at um, to look at their own situations and say, boy, you know, maybe I should start leaking some of this stuff. Maybe I don't like what's going on. I don't like how they're treating this guy. Maybe I want to leak some stuff too, right? You are going to create a situation that essentially has a lot more repercussions and consequences, secondary consequences, third, uh, tertiary consequences, and after effects, blowback, that they are completely not prepared for and they're completely not even thinking about right they're in in their mind it's very one dimensional we're going to make an example of this guy we're going to throw the book at them at him but again you know uh princess leia says in star wars right the the more you tighten your grip the more systems will will uh uh slip through your fingers right and that's that's exactly what will happen here versus a situation where you make a deal you it, it stays very quiet He kind of goes off on his way and you go off on your way and there's, you know, there's no narrative. There's no huge courtroom drama about it. This isn't a John Grisham novel. This is real life. We don't need, you know, this, this, and believe the the trial of Julian Assange would be, I mean, the leading story in the world if that, if it does go down that road. And it seems unfortunately for them uh, and for everyone that that's, that's the route they want to take. Uh, 
I think that would probably lead to an outcome that they're not thinking of that would not be good. But so presumably, yeah, presumably, though, it would be a secret trial, which is what would make everyone see America as like triple double oh, evil. That would even be worse. My goodness, yeah. that would be, if it was a trial that was held behind closed doors uh, to some extent, which is very hard to do in the United States. Um, but if, if, my gosh, if, if, if it were held behind closed doors, that would make it even worse because uh, there's nothing that generates more attention than telling people that something is going on, but you can't know what it is. <laughs> right? Mm. Oh, so, absolutely. Uh, right. So absolutely. you're going to create an even bigger situation that way. If you, want to, if you really wanted to mitigate this and make it smaller and not suffer these kind of leaks and try to prevent more like that, more, uh, this from happening well number one uh stop being corrupt that's number that's obviously number one that's that's not targeting anyone in institution but just you know system-wide uh and then number two you know stop stop lying to the public and then number two is treat the situation by understanding that when even though it really aggravates you and harms U.S. interests when Julian Assange leaked classified information, classified tools, and U.S. capabilities, but understand that he's doing it from a different perspective than you have, and try to understand his perspective in order to meet him halfway. That's I brilliant. Wish... Oh, your sound's gone. Say, say something. I was just saying, I, I oh. think that if they spent um, a little bit of try time trying to understand why he's doing what he's doing and to understand that just because he does it on the internet, it doesn't necessarily make it different, the New York Times, Washington Post, that perhaps instead of leading to what would essentially be a public relations nightmare for them, that mm -hmm. they could instead try to find some sort of solution whereby in nobody is completely satisfied <laughs> right mm -hmm. but but the, the issue is resolved what about the fact that it would be very tempting i'm sure for gina and anybody in the secret service to simply want to make an example of julian to make sure that nobody wants to be like him supposing they were to go that route because that's certainly the one that I've heard expressed where people say they want to make an example of him to terrify anyone from doing what he's tried to do. Do you think that's a real possible, you know, motivation that they might, you know, that might, oh, that might motivate them? Way of looking at it. I think it's completely the mindset that they have on this. They want to do whatever they can to, uh, to demonize Julian, to, uh, make him appear to be the scum of the earth uh, in order to what they think, and once again, shock and awe, right? It's this, we, I just mm -hmm. mentioned how shock and awe tactics were a complete failure in the Iraq war. There will be a complete failure here as well because they do not mm -hmm. adhere to the principles of 4D warfare. This is, this is second generation warfare type stuff. This is, this is not taking, because they, they fail mm -hmm. to take the public relations aspect into it. Uh, this is going to have the same effect as the, um, uh, what was the place? The, uh, the the prison photos that were coming out in Iraq. This is this mm. any of the public relations nightmares you can think of that the U.S. government has suffered over the past decade and a half. This would be right up there with them. See, really, what you're describing is a group of people who genuinely, let's just give them credit, genuinely feel that they're trying to do what's best for America, but well, in their, like they are. right in their Pardon? mind, they are. Right, so obviously from that point of view, um, I actually, I think it's, it's so simple and it's so brilliant what you're saying. You're saying, be able to see another person's viewpoint. That's basically what you're saying. And understand I, that I, actually, I, sorry. And, and, and oh, actually, I, I, I try to, you know, I do. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it is so simple that it's brilliant. Um, I, I hope that Gina does really think about this. This is not about trying to destroy the CIA in its efforts to do what's right for America. What it really is, is it's a checks and balance situation where, you know, look, I'll, I'll give you an analogy of making a film and somebody directing it. 
any director that just goes into complete like Otto Preminger mode and just goes, you will do what I want. You know, right. the actors, the actors just shrivel into themselves and it's a horrible experience and it's awful. Great. How, that, how um, does that work out? Yeah, terribly. But what, 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 actually it ends up being a much more powerful creative mix is when somebody is able to freely express an idea and my father for instance made the rule no idea is a bad idea there's just better ideas and really this speaks to the whole idea of a marketplace of ideas and free speech and free press is the understanding which is really not that hard to understand that you get balance and sanity when people have proper discourse and information and that although she may think she's trying to make a great film by controlling everything, like I'm talking to Gina, the fact is you don't have a powerful creative intermingling and you know, she at least must appreciate this. We also have rights. The rest of humanity has rights. America, you know, she may want to look after America, but everybody else has rights. And I think that it would be incredibly powerful. I think America would be an absolute light in the heavens if the CIA would do what they were supposed to do, which is analyze geopolitical situations, speak to the president who was, you know, properly elected, um, and ease up on controlling the planet. Because control, like that kind of control, my analogy, is the most devastating thing that you can do in any creative situation. And I want to believe that civilization is a creative activity. It's not a control activity, you know? And so I think the simplicity of what you said- well, And we see that with uh, totalitarian governments. Every, every time, you know, a, a government is put in place that, that restricts freedom of speech, restricts freedom of thought, free expression, uh, it tries to create this ordered society, whether it be along, uh, you know, the communist class lines or the fascist, like racial kind of kind of lines. It's a mm -hmm. complete failure. It's a complete right. utter and absolute failure. And that's because humans, humanity, uh, we we are not developed or created to mm -hmm. to act in that way. That's not how we operate. It's not how we're wired. It's not how we're designed. So do you think that Gina and the rest of the Secret Service top brass could move into a place where they can have, just have, that maybe there are things that go wrong, that are embarrassing, that are corrupt, that it creates a healthy balance if there is a press out there that's able to say, we as the people that you are supposedly taking care of, don't want you to do this. Do you think that that's real or do you think the, that top brass CIA are designed to ignore that kind of balance? Well, you said you have a Peter Principle scenario there, uh, but I'd like to believe, maybe it's because I'm an optimist, but I'd like to believe that there are people that would be willing to listen to reason. Uh, whether it's specifically her or others, I'm not sure. Um, I actually had uh, the opportunity, i tell a story, but I had the opportunity, uh, I was serving at Guantanamo Bay at one point during the my time in the service. And right. one of the delegations that came down was, uh, believe it or not, John McCain, uh, Dianne Feinstein, and at the time because of the Obama administration, uh, Dennis McDonough, uh, Barack Obama's chief of staff. Mm -hmm. And of the three, uh, you know, McCain was very set in his way, set in his view, didn't want to hear anything we had to say. Feinstein was more respectful, but also very set in her way. Uh, John McCain was not respectful at all. It's just a complete a-hole. Um, mm -hmm. But actually, Dennis McDonough, who was the uh, the chief of staff to Barack Obama, someone whose politics are, I'm not in line with, you know, whatsoever, he was a very reasonable guy and he was extremely respectful. We had a fantastic, substantive, engaging conversation. Um, he understood the push and pull of things. He understood human nature very well. Uh, he understood that we were trying to come at the situation that we were in from, from our perspective. 
he presented the administration's perspective and, and that was also sort of a, a, a good balancing factor between our interests and whatever it was that McCain and Feinstein were, were putting out. But it was fantastic to be in that situation and just realize that there was, there was a reasonable person in the room uh, who could find a middle ground or at least bring us all to a middle ground that enabled some actual progress to take place instead of the two sides simply just just you know just getting into a flame war over it mm. i mean really actually the fact so that they're out there. Were, they're, 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 and yeah. believe it or not this was the same years later and i'll, I'll, put, I'll put a flip side on that so years later um when when there was a huge push and uh, Barack Obama was looking at uh, attacking uh, the, the Syrian government, right? Later on, I guess like 2015, was looking at, you know, potentially actually, or no, it was, it was 2013, um, you know, attacking the Syrian government, claiming, you know, chemical attacks and everything. And eventually he was talked out of it. And I remember reading this one line in an article. He said, Barack Obama decided to change his mind after going on a long walk with his chief of staff, Dennis McDonough. And I said, ah. <laughs> hey. I knew, I, knew that. I knew that was a reasonable guy. I knew, I knew I liked, there was something I liked about that guy. Well, you should send a tweet to President Trump to get that guy on his advisory team. I, I, I actually, I, I really would love for you if you don't mind and if I'm putting you on the spot then I don't think I am though because I think you've got plenty to say if you were to be that advisor that person that shows real balance and perspective what would you say to President Trump to guide him towards a resolution that not only would make Americans celebrate him for supporting constitutional law, because let's face it, it's unconstitutional and it's against constitutional law, it's a felony to make secret crimes committed by the government or the military. I know it's embarrassing, but it says in the constitution, I mean, I'm quoting John Kiriakou here. He says it's against the law. You're not allowed to make secret and classify things that are actually a crime. Um, what would you advise President Trump as a, as an analyst, as an intelligence analyst, which is really what the CIA should be, right? Not, not a sort of an underground, underworld, you know, government. Um, what well, would you- quite, quite, quite a bit of their, their charter was changed after 9-11 into a very different organization. Yeah, well, that would be a whole nother hour if you were to describe that. Um, yes. But yeah. Um, what would you, I mean, I want you to walk down the garden path with President Trump right now, and I w would love to know what you would say to him to help him. Well, one, one big thing I would say to him just from a political perspective is that, um, you know, sir, your, your base uh, are, are huge fans of Mr. Assange. Um, they view his work in 2016 as being pivotal to your victory and exposing the corruption of uh, the, the Podesta brothers, of Sidney Blumenthal, of the Clinton Foundation. Uh, they view the work that Assange did and at the, the time that he did it as perhaps, you know, a turning point catalyst for, you know, for your election at all. And so, you know, to f turn on somebody who they viewed as an ally, as a huge ally. And I, I believe me, I remember 2016, uh, you know, I was a Trump supporter and, you know, every time Julian put out a tweet, every time that he announced he was going to be on some uh, show or doing a press conference, I mean, it was, it, the world was waiting with bated breath to see what Julian had. And in the end, he came through, right? In the end, he he delivered everything that he promised, right? Um, and so to the president, I would say from a political perspective, you there will be a substantial chunk of your followers that view this as, you know, a betrayal of sorts, that view this as a capitulation to someone who was there for you when you needed him, and now you're not there for them 
at a time where, oh, by the way, you're looking at a re-election fight, which, you know, isn't going to be easy. I mean, uh, you know, President Trump only won by about 80,000 votes across three different states. That's not a lot, right? Electorally, he did fine. But if you look at the actual vote numbers, you change around a few states and, and we have President Hillary Clinton. So in, in a situation like that, I would say, why rock the boat with something like this? Why, why do this now? Why do this at all? Or is there another way? Is there a third way? Uh, you know, and, and there a way to cut a deal with this guy so that you are you don't lose your base over this, but also you don't you know uh, uh, generate the ire and animus of the intelligence community which essentially he kind of already has, right? <laughs> because of, uh, you know, every, of the way they've acted. But, you know, is there, is there a way to, again, find that middle ground, um, which he's been able to do on a number of other issues? I mean, if you can negotiate with Kim Jong-un over the North Korean nuclear program, you think you can negotiate <laughs> about that? Absolutely. I, I, I love that. I, I don't know whether you have to go. I hope you don't, because our next guest is still not here. So I'm just wondering what's happened to him. Uh, but if you need to go, that's fine, because God knows I can bloody blather away. I'm quite happily on my own. But before you leave, because I think you have such incredible insight and such a balanced view, do you feel that President Trump would because I do, I think he would. Do you think he would gain an enormous following if he would just take action against the big tech giants and absolutely oh and absolutely yeah. guard, guard our I mean, that's First actually Amendment something right. where I mean, there's so much, you know, and, and looking at him for in terms of just, just as any politician, right? Mm. Uh, and the, there's two, there's two interesting aspects to this. Number one is there's nobody on any side of politics right now who supports the tech giants, right? Every, we, we, are, we all kind of know subconsciously that we're beholden to them uh, mm. because of the, the inordinate power they have over society and that, it, and that they have all of our data, right? So there's, and that, that, that creates this sort of chilling effect where we're critical of them, but at the same time, we're also in their in their uh in their grasp right we're beholden to them in a sense we yeah use them for welcome yeah welcome we, to social scoring american style right 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 so yeah the other and the other flip side of the other interesting aspect is so so there's number one there i mean there'd be so much political capital that you could stand to gain uh from independents and probably some democrats too if you would just do something about this um you know really the, i think the way forward in the next 10 years, maybe in the next five, is, is going to be, uh, we're going to see the rise of a digital rights movement, an internet bill of rights, and whether it be the, the right or the left, it's this huge swath of, of political um, uh, uh, just geography, territory that nobody's taken a, really taken a mantle of. I mean, the left tried to with net neutrality, um, but that kind of went away. And, you know, I, I, I think I have a one-year-old son who will be one in, in, a, in a month. And How sweet. I think, <laughs> I think to him what social media will be or what the internet will be, and he'll, he'll never know a world without 24-7 mm -hmm. connectivity uh, to everyone. And, and I, I even noticed with um, uh, sort of Generation Z, the Zoomers, they don't view internet communications as different from any other form of communication. They don't view the internet as different from picking up your phone or calling somebody. And essentially now the technology is different. So why don't, isn't any different. So why don't we govern those communications the same way we would govern any other communications, right? And so use the existing law that's already on the books to actually just apply it to this, right? So that, that's all number one. Number two, which is what's an interesting aspect is, there's no other politician in America that would be willing to do something like this outside of Donald Trump, because he's the only one who just has the, I guess, bull in a china shop attitude of, mm -hmm. I'm just going to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't care what they're going to say about me. 
that could do this. And I, I don't know if we'll ever have a president after him that would be mm -hmm. like that. And by the way, I, I say that regardless of uh, whether you like the man or not, right? But mm -hmm. every other politician is going to be willing to play politics, is going to want to go along with the flow on one side or the other, is going to be looking at opinion polls. But if there's one thing you know about Trump, you know, you know, love him or hate mm -hmm. him, it's he he does what he's going to do. And he says what he's going to say. And you always know his opinion on something. He's very clear about that. And so I don't think there'd be anyone else who's willing to take on these companies, these companies that control our data, that have our personal mm -hmm. community that what what congressman wants to see their uh, google search results you know displayed all over all over the internet or their uh, or their facebook private chats or their google or their gmail emails right of course not yeah actually you've raised a very important point because first of all i've understood that facebook and google are basically babies of the cia that they were born of a cia um project, presumably. I mean, what better way to surveil and control information than to have created Facebook and Google? Well, Do you think that's that, true? Yeah. Do you um, think it's true? Regardless of how they, regardless of how they were created, it's, there's certainly a relationship today. I mean, there's very mm -hmm. close relationship today. They're similar to the, uh, you know, the NSA relationship with AT&T and Verizon, right? It's, it's, mm -hmm. they're all, sharing they're all sharing information they all have you know uh co-located offices and things like that so 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 i guess but, the but question is this way, it, uh, sorry. oh what was i gonna say the 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 abilities that they are the one thing that george orwell got wrong that he couldn't have foreseen was that um we wouldn't need big brother because we would be the ones giving our information over <laughs> That's the most heartbreaking aspect of this. This is where you cry like Isn't oceans it? of tears. It's just like, oh yeah. my God, we're such bloody fools. But going back to Trump, if you were speaking to Trump right now. <laughs> there's, there's those early what? text messages from that early Facebook chat that was leaked from Mark Zuckerberg, where um, he says that back when he started Facebook, because it was supposed mm -hmm. to be the, you know, it was originally a ranking of, uh, uh, the looks of girls in different sororities. Oh, uh, I remember that. Yes. And so the 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 message is between he and one of his friends was, yeah, all of these girls are putting their personal information on onto my website. They say, why are they doing that? I don't know, but they're all giving it to me. <laughs> well, you know, look, that's the, that. This is where it starts to get sort of like heartbreaking again. It's human beings are very social and they're very they're yeah. very um, they're very um unsuspecting very trusting very interested in communicating i mean the fact that actually maybe these things are too addictive and too crazy god knows i spend too long on twitter but what i really want to understand because i am not joking i stalk president trump i've probably tweeted more to him than anyone else on the planet where i've said please enforce antitrust laws on these companies so Here's the problem. Is the Justice Department, just like, you know, all the other departments of government, just completely corrupt? Is that why we can't enforce antitrust laws? Because God knows, Google and Facebook have long ago, and Amazon, passed the level of hugeness that you need in order to enforce antitrust laws. Is there a reason why Trump won't take them on? It's when you get because they have become uh, what's that what's that phrase from Wall Street too big to fail right because right. they've they've gone beyond the the point of no return on that this is something where in order to take some type of action from the federal government level you you would need the president and the attorney general working in conjunction to bring forward anything on them with that I mean that's something where there's there's a, Department of Justice is like anywhere else, right? It's it's run by people. The the process. No no U.S. attorney sitting in an office in Northern California is going to sit there and say, "Oh, I'm just going to take on these all these companies by myself." Right? No, of course. Right. Not. Right. Mm -hmm. You you would need a top down level approach because of the political ramifications, because of the social and economic ramifications of this, 
Um, and look, it is something that's been discussed, right? Wh whether or not they should be broken up, whether or not antitrust should be enforced. And that is a very real discussion that's going on within the Trump administration that I, I actually can tell you that that is something that they are looking at. I don't know if it's, no, they're not willing yet to really pull the trigger because I mean, that they know that that would be launching a war. Um, well, wait, like, wait, wait, wait. Why would that be launching a war? A war with who? With with the tech companies, the tech giants. Yeah, but 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 you know, like they're companies. They're not a law unto themselves, or are they? <laughs> you know, are uh, we so? At the know. end of the day, it's uh, it does come down to uh, I guess uh, realism in a sense. These companies have massive resources. They have massive uh, information wealth. They have massive ties to other governments around the around the world. Obviously, Google's you know deeply embedded with Google, uh, China, and mm. um, it, they would have to weigh those different aspects against each other before wanting to pull that trigger. Well, that's extremely depressing to think that a stupid bloody social media company is more powerful than the whole of the United States. But listen, while you were talking, I had an idea. I was thinking you were talking about these digital laws. Well, By the way, the just age. tell me. We are, we are in the social media age now. We are. I mean, you look at, right. you look at the, the at power in the United States. Mm -hmm. Power used to be New York, D.C., L.A., right? Now mm -hmm. it's New York, D.C., L.A., Silicon Valley, Sam right? Well. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and if you look where the flow of it is going, it's, it's more towards Palo Alto than any of the other three. Right, but I just can't imagine that you could end up with companies so large that they literally could take out America. That's a bit like scary. Uh, but I had an idea, which I, which I just wanted to share with you about digital laws, because this has often occurred to me. I was thinking about how, you know, YouTube just removed um, Alex Jones's Infowar channels and like years and years and decades of a zillion, zillion videos just disappeared, including mine, because I did an interview with him. And um, well, I realized- at this point right alex was oh know, sure guess but they, the smaller ones and people on the right, right, right. People, right but wait oh. wait jack 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 i'm desperate to make my point so i was thinking the number one digital law should be that one has a right to upload sorry download was it one's entire account like i've been tweeting since 2013 or 12 or something if i had the right to take all of my data and download it so that I could go, let's say, to Gab, right? And take all my previous Twitter information and take it over there. Or if, let's say I had a YouTube and I had like, Alex had millions of, oh, you poor thing, you're tired. Please yawn freely. Um, uh, that the number one law should be that we have a right to our product because that is our product. And our product is what made YouTube, Google, Twitter, be able to monetize our content that we've worked on, right? Now, the first law should be that we have a right to download that so we and can that, go that elsewhere. Be, be intellectual property. Right, right. So we, the first digital law that I want is that it's my own intellectual property that these big companies are monetizing, right? Um, and that I should be allowed to download it and take my business elsewhere, which basically means that anybody can start up like Gab and we can go somewhere else. So in, this, in effect, if we get that one law that we are absolutely allowed to download our own uh, account if they want to close us down, let's say Twitter wants to close me down, then I'm allowed to download it and go to Gab. But right so it's now- a, It's a content portability. Yes, oh, beautiful. Oh my God, that's like perfect. Content. Um, Say it again, portability. Content portability. portability. Yeah, portability. That is absolutely brilliant. Well, it's this like, you... um, when you have a when you have a phone number. You can, right. You can, you can move your number. That was a big thing early on with the phone carriers. They would they would they would if you tried to switch your carrier, they wouldn't let you keep your number, right? But they don't do that right. anymore because it, the market just wouldn't bear. People said, No, I want my number. And I want to be able to move, and eventually, I think T-Mobile was the first one that started. Now they all do. Mm -hmm. They just have to. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so, if social media companies were forced to do that as well, that's a fantastic idea. 
Um, oh, thanks. Good story. I really do. It's the first time I've heard someone who's stated directly. I mean, I didn't recognize him. I didn't recognize him because, you know, I didn't want to know what I'm doing with my friends. And, you know, that's how I talk to people. I don't know. What do I do about all the time? Like, contacts, all these messages. Mm -hmm. Years worth of conversations that I have. You know, now I just lost all of that, I and mean, that was my personal information. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm very satisfied with my idea okay. because it's a really a one, a one note Johnny bit of law. You just say this is intellectual property that you're monetizing. Great, but our legal right is to be able to download it and take our business elsewhere, especially if you don't like us and you're going to um, censor. Listen, I can see how tired you are, and I know you have a baby. It probably means he's going to like come crawling into your bed in about. He will. Oh, let's uh, see. <laughs> in about another hour, he'll be. He'll be. He'll be up. <laughs> oh dear, but I'd love to keep you because I just love talking to you. But I know you're tired. I don't have another guest, but don't feel guilty because I, I'm sure that. Well, I do they actually will be have to get run yeah. because I have an event at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning in DC. Oh my God. Listen, Jack, it was such an amazing pleasure to talk to you. And I, I'm going to listen back to this interview because you said such great things. And I, God almighty, will you just go and speak to President Trump and just tell him these sensible things that you've said? Because this resolution is I will, so I will simple. I will call him up right now. I will call him up right go now. On. I don't know if he'll be happy with that at 1.30 in the morning. But uh, anyway, listen. Probably tweeting. Okay, listen, it was a California pleasure. Right Oh, oh, so he'll probably be, you know, be having a cup of, cup, of, cup of coffee after dinner. So, Jack, I cannot tell you what a pleasure it's been to talk to you. And I don't know what's happened to our other guests. I hope he hasn't just given up the ghost because we've been chatting so much. But anyway, mwah, I love you. You're brilliant. And I really, really want you to talk sense to these people because you're so, you've got such soul, Jack. Well, and you've I appreciate got such this, intelligence. Thank you very much. And by the way, we are going to have to work on, I'm going to have to work on getting you on uh, on One American News, do something, or, you know, even just if we do a Periscope together or something. I think this would be fantastic. I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to because I have a few things to say about lots of things, but I really love talking to you. So that would be the best part for me. I love it. <laughs>